At dawn on the morning of the 6th of June, 1944, 225 rangers jumped off the British landing craft and ran to the bottom of these cliffs. Their mission was one of the most difficult and daring of the invasion, to climb these sheer and desolate cliffs and take out the enemy guns. The rangers looked up and saw the enemy soldiers at the edge of the cliffs shooting down at them with machine guns and throwing grenades. And the American rangers began to climb. When one ranger fell, another would take his place. When one rope was cut, a ranger would grab another and begin his climb again. They climbed, shot back, and held their footing. Soon, one by one, the rangers pulled themselves over the top. And in seizing the firm land at the top of these cliffs, they began to seize back the continent of Europe. The teamwork and determination displayed on that fateful day at Point du Hoc not only demonstrates the best of the United States Army, but it also represents our mission at the Association of the United States Army. Soldiers supporting soldiers. For almost 75 years, AUSA has served soldiers, providing a voice for the Army, and celebrated those who have helped the Army community. We've experienced tremendous growth and are now over one million members strong and growing. We continue to provide essential services to soldiers, civilians, retirees, veterans, and family members. We engage with the Army, Congress, industry partners, and communities across the globe. And we work to advance national security and promote greater recognition of the Army's vital role in American life. But we're not stopping there. We're evolving the way we educate, inform, and connect America to the Army. We're developing our Center for Leadership to inspire Army leaders. We're investing in our Army communities with a broader membership reach. And we're building stronger links between generations to support the Army's critical needs. As we charted AUSA's path for the future, we realized we needed a new symbol to represent what we do a logo inspired by the significance of the soldier experience and the Army story. A logo inspired by our focus on people. Because, as General Creek Nabram said, people aren't in the Army. They are the Army. A logo inspired by the achievements of those brave soldiers at Point du Hoc on that fateful day in 1944. This is that emblem. AUSA, it takes a team, soldiers, families, civilians, retirees, veterans, industry, and you. The Association of the United States Army is pleased to welcome you to AUSA's new report webinar series. This webinar series features presentations by senior Army leaders responsible for key programs and initiatives. It also features contemporary military authors who weave together the past, present, and future story of the United States Army. Kicking off today's webinar is AUSA's President and CEO, General Retired Bob Brown. Good afternoon and welcome to the Association of the United States Army's Noon Report. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We appreciate your support as partners in the defense of our nation. Joining us today, we have a very special guest, General Mark Milley, U.S. Army Retired. Please take advantage of having General Milley here to ask questions. You can use the question and answer tab on the right side of your screen to submit a question. After the discussion, we will take as many questions as possible. 
and you can find the full bio for General Milley in the handouts tab. General Mark Milley most recently served as the 20th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, retiring in 2023. Prior to becoming Chairman, he was the 39th Chief of Staff of the United States Army. He has held multiple command and staff positions in six divisions and a Special Forces Group. He has multiple deployments around the world, including numerous times in Iraq and Afghanistan. He graduated from Princeton University in 1980 with a bachelor's in political science, has a master's in international relations from Columbia, and a master's in national security studies from the U.S. Army, uh, U.S. Navy War College. Almost missed it there, <laughs> Navy War College. You were studying much harder. Yes, of course. Yeah. So uh, welcome and, and thanks for joining us, Mark. Really appreciate thanks, you Mark. being here. Thank you. Uh, 44 years, I'm telling you, I, as I was going through it, uh, it's amazing, the service, unbelievable selfless service. And I know the last eight years, you look at uh, two of the toughest jobs in the world, right in a row, just mm -hmm. incredible. So yeah. thanks for joining us. And well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate yeah, it. absolutely. I want to kind of get right into, uh, I want to go way back. When you're going to Princeton. Great. No, this will be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go way back, like it was yesterday, uh, only only uh, a while ago. But like uh, when you were going to Princeton, playing hockey, yeah. what led you to to uh, join ROTC and think about service in the Army? Well, the service part really comes, I suppose, from my neighborhood and my parents. Mm. Um, I grew up in a uh, very much an Irish and, and Italian neighborhood and um, in a little suburb of, uh, of Boston. And I would say maybe it wasn't 100%, but pretty close to 100% of the Adults, the mothers mm. and fathers, uh, in one way or another, served in World War II. Mm. Uh, very patriotic. Uh, there were no officers. They were all enlisted in one mm. way or another. Uh, and my dad uh, served. He was a Navy corpsman, uh, so he's a, a medic. Wow. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And he was a, a Navy corpsman with the 4th Marine Division. He did the assault mm. landings at, uh, you know, Kwajalein, Saipan, Tinian, and Iwo Jima. Wow. Saw a lot of fighting. Uh, yeah. his, his younger brother, he was the oldest of 10, but his next uh, brother was hitting the beach at Normandy when he was hitting the beach at Saipan mm. in June 1944. Mm. My mother served in the uh, in the medical corps, mm. the Navy Medical Corps out in the hospital in Seattle, took care of the wounded, mm. come back from the Central Pacific. Yeah. So there was a real spirit of, um, you know, patriotic duty, a mm -hmm. real sense of how lucky we were to be Americans, mm -hmm. uh, and that in some manner, shape, or form, you need to kind of pay back. So Did um, they uh, talk about a lot when they got together and you would you'd, you'd hear that? that well, you as know, kids, they didn't talk to you about it as kids. I yeah. Mean, yeah. They weren't going to tell you about the Battle of Iwo Jima right, or, right. or that sort of thing. Um, um, but they did talk to each other about yeah. it. You know, they were, yeah. they were uh, all laborers of one kind yeah. or another, and they'd all get together late in the afternoon and uh, take the kids out, play sports, and they'd be right. coaching our teams. And, and you'd hear stories growing up um, uh, at the dinner table or, or, or after school or that kind of thing. So, yeah, And it was during Vietnam, which was yeah. pretty controversial. Yeah. So yeah. national security and, and service in the military mm -hmm. was a hot topic of the day. Um, so I, I was, you know, very fortunate to grow up in that environment, and and they imbued almost by osmosis uh, a sense that this is a great country, this is a country uh, worth serving, this is a country that mm -hmm. uh, we should pay back, and, and and so they put that in in you know into your head, uh, yeah. and that's what yeah. leads to service. Uh, I went, I was very fortunate to go to a, a great high school, mm. uh, which is uh, one of the real significant hockey high schools in America, mm. um, and and I had some great coaches and teachers and mentors there many of whom served, some mm. in Vietnam, some in Korea, some in World right. War II. Uh, and it was sort of the same thing. And, right. and there, uh, I started to learn about, uh, essentially, uh, not only what this country was about from an academic historical standpoint, uh, but the essence of the country, which was the Constitution. Right. I took a class in my high school on, on the Constitution, and it just stuck with me. Uh, my father and mother, although they didn't go to college, knew a lot about our yeah. country's history. Yeah. And, Right. And knew a lot about the Constitution. They understood. So that foundation laid very. It was early. absolutely there. Yeah. yeah that, no so that that's what yeah. led me to want to serve. Yeah. Uh, I got recruited at a bunch of different schools for hockey. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, Princeton had ROTC plus hockey plus right. great academic, and I was right. lucky enough to get in there. Right. Uh, so that's what led me there. That's cool. Uh, and then the uh, and the coach was a Vietnam veteran, mm. uh, the hockey coach. I didn't know uh, that. He was yeah. a, he was a yeah. captain of the Marine Corps in Vietnam. And, wow. And he uh, you know he encouraged me to go to Princeton and. And, yeah. and play hockey there and also yeah. consider it the ROTC program. So that's how I got in. Yeah, and, that's and I never, fantastic. Uh, I never at all thought I'd stay in. Well, I was going to ask you that. I'm sure you didn't come in thinking you'd serve 44 years no, over a million years. But no. what uh, did you go through phases as a lot of us do? You know, kind of yeah, not sure, sure if you were going to stay yeah, yeah, yeah. and what what, uh, what helped you make your, your decision to, to serve that long? Well, like any uh, officer, any young officer, 
uh, you're not sure what you're necessarily going right. to do. So I wanted to come in, serve my country, uh, and then get out to some other walk of life. Um, yeah. And uh, and I took it in increments. My commit my commissioning requirement was four years for ROTC. Yours from West Point's five. Um, and uh, and then I thought that was the first decision point: stay in or get out. Mm. Uh, and at that point, uh, I uh, was engaged and getting married, and and I wanted to stay in to command a company. Uh, so I did. I, I stayed mm. in through company command, uh, which takes you out to seven, eight, nine, ten year mm -hmm. mark sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I was thinking yet again, that's another decision point about the 10 year mark, right. but to get out. And right. I decided you know, to stay in through uh, through the major years and to see if I would be competitive with the Italian mm -hmm. command. So I took the whole thing in small increments. Uh, there was never a grand plan. I would, in yeah. fact, I would advise anybody, especially in the military, but probably in any walk of life, if you have some sort of grand plan uh, that you're gonna end up, uh, you know, if you're a lieutenant, you're gonna end up as a general, mm -hmm. you're probably in the wrong wrong yeah, way. Yeah, if you think you're, you're trying to be a, a yeah. general, you're not gonna be. Right, really, exactly. Just yeah, take it day yeah. by day, do the yeah. best you can. Do the right uh, thing. Do the yeah. right thing yeah. and, and focus on doing the hard jobs well. That's, yeah. that's what you need to do. Well, and that's what I was gonna say. So, you know, having been so successful and obviously, uh, your, your career just took off. What, what are some leadership advice you would give uh, those those uh, young leaders out there now based on your experience and all you went through? Uh, what would you tell them, some of the key things for those, those leaders? Well, as, uh, you know, as, as you well know uh, from your career as well as mine and others, um, you know, leadership lessons often come from lots of mistakes and, mm -hmm. and things that you've learned over the years. You, you get good leadership lessons from those that you want to emulate and get bad leadership lessons at those you'd never want to emulate. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got thousands of leadership lessons, but I sometimes I would, learning more from bad leadership. Of course you, you do. Yeah, you yeah, that's expect right. Expect the good leadership and that's it stands right. out when it's bad. You know, and, uh, I would, uh, I, you know, for, for brevity purposes, I yeah. would, I would say uh, a couple of key things. Uh, first, uh, for the army uh, or the Navy, Air Force, Marines, any mm -hmm. form of uh, public service, it's commitment. And, mm. and what are you committed to? You're committed to the country. Right. Uh, you're committed to the men and women of this country that don't have the uh, the privilege of serving. Right. Uh, you're committed to the greater good. Mm. Uh, and and at the end of the day, what we in uniform are committed to is wrapped up in our oath. Yeah. Uh, we are committed to the Constitution, the idea right. that is America, right. uh, and the form of government that we have. And we're very very lucky yeah. uh, to have that government. So we're very lucky to have the uh, Constitution as a very flexible document. There's 27 amendments now. Yeah. Um, and, and so we're committed to preserving and protecting that document, the idea that is America, the, the, uh, the, the Constitution of the United States, uh, uh, and protect that against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I've heard you before talk about how unique that is in the world. It's really you know, unique. Most armies will swear to a person. That's right. Uh, you know, certainly not a, 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 uh, yeah. a document that's... Uh, no, we, we swear yeah. an oath really to yeah. an idea. Yeah. Um, you know, to yeah. a... To a document, the Constitution, yeah. which is yeah. not uh, very far from here, actually, it's only right. a few minutes down the road. Right. Um, and and we swear an oath to uh, an idea, a form of government, uh, of, uh, of we the people, for mm -hmm. the people, by the people, sort of thing, and where people have a voice in how they are governed. Mm -hmm. That was a novel idea in seventeen yeah. in yeah. the seventeen hundreds. Yeah. Uh, the, the countries of of those days were all kings and queens and right. monarchies and so on right. and so forth. Uh, the idea that people would have a voice in their own form of government. Uh, was novel. It was radical. That's mm -hmm. why it's called the Revolution, the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that that document's been modified, like I said, twenty-seven times over, yeah. over yeah. the course of our history. But but that document is what we in the military are committed to. So I would say, you know, your first principle of leadership is whatever, whatever line of work you're going to do, be committed yeah. uh, to that line of work. That's and, great and, advice, and, and, yes. and that becomes yeah. our North Star sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. And then I would say, you know, the second is, uh, you know, you've got to have. The courage of your conviction, so your mm -hmm. courage of your commitment, sort of mm -hmm. thing. And so you've got to be able to stand there uh, mm -hmm. in times of intense discussions yeah. or stress. Yeah. Uh, lean forward and realize that you know one of the one, you know the logo that's above our head right now is from Point to Hawk, right? Mm -hmm. And realize that you know almost two thousand guys gave their lives in yeah. Normandy yeah. Uh, to defeat Nazi Germany right. and, and, right. and fascism and Nazism, etc. Mm -hmm. My dad hits the beach at Iwo Jima to mm -hmm. defeat Imperial mm -hmm. Japan and. And, and tens of thousands, millions of American soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines yeah. uh, have given their lives or have been seriously wounded uh, and sacrificed enormous amounts to preserve that constitution. Mm -hmm. So you gotta have the physical courage to do that and the, and the moral courage to stand there in the breach and to do that. So and courage- both the are tested so much in challenging times. They're physical tested- Physical and moral and- All the know, time. And, and I know in your many deployments, combat deployments, uh, you saw incredible uh, you know, testing of moral courage and physical courage and everything else. 
what so that commitment uh, allowed you to, to demonstrate and, and I, I know examples of where you uh, were, were in harm's way uh, to, to, uh, to save soldiers etc frequently you know and so that was a commitment that led to that and right. demonstrating that courage. And that becomes your, yeah. you know, the commitment is your in the North Star. Right. And then you have to have the moral and physical courage to, to go with it. Right. Uh, I would I would also uh, tell you that, you know, the old adage of mission and men sort of thing yeah. and, and yeah. You know, mission and men and women. Uh, the, yeah. the idea that you have to not only accomplish the mission, uh, but you have to take care of the people. Uh, so compassion, uh, literally, you know, a, a form of leader's love for their troops. Yeah. Uh, you have to have that. You have to believe and feel and, mm. and internalize the fact that your soldiers are in so many ways uh, part of your actual family. Yeah. Uh, and so you've got to take care of them. Yeah. And taking care of them doesn't mean being soft on them or, right. or being easy. Well, I was on just going to ask it because a lot of people say, oh, that means, but no. No. Uh, in it, fact, it, it means maintaining standards and right. maintaining uh, so, that, so that they are mm -hmm. uh, being taken care of in times of intense stress. Mm -hmm when the thing most precious to anybody, their human life, right. uh, is on the line. Right. And, then, and that brings me to confidence. Uh, yeah. You know, you, no one is gonna wanna follow a leader who is constantly lost and yeah. navigates poorly or, yeah. or calls in indirect fire in their own position, et cetera. Uh, so uh, what the troops are looking for uh, is a degree of confidence in your mm -hmm. leadership. You, you don't have to be perfect. Everyone, mm -hmm. no one mm -hmm. expects perfection, uh, but you've gotta be reasonably competent. Uh, so I think those are the key things. And the last one I'd fill in there, uh, is integrity. Yeah, uh, you've got to maintain yeah. uh, your integrity. Character it's, it's matters. Tested a lot. Tested a lot. You know, and you talk you to gotta, young leaders; they think, "Oh, that's that's easy." Oh, well, it get it will get it, tested, it gets more tested more and more. More challenging situations, right. and yeah. it changes as you go. Yeah, yeah. You know, good point. Leadership yeah. at the lower level is direct yeah. leadership, where you're right. interacting right. with troops, and leadership at the higher levels is right. a bit more indirect. But right. but your integrity matters. Character matters. Right. Uh, and you've got to be true to yourself, true to your inner core, and true right. to your constitution. That, that that's great, and. Uh, uh, really appreciate you laying that out. I don't think it could, be, could have been done any better. Uh, good job. I'm going to go to some questions from the audience already. We're getting oh, some great. good ones in. Uh, Colonel Retired Brian Cook. Uh, Brian, thanks for asking. He said, uh, sir, thanks so much for the talk today. What's the single largest threat to our nation and our ability to win in great power competition? Easy question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I'd offer you a couple of things to think about. Uh, one is how to think about it. So, yeah. Um, in the Department of Defense and in the military, we are more or less a relatively traditional uh, organization uh, for good, uh, good and bad. And we look at the world and threats uh, in terms of those that can do harm. Yeah. Uh, you know, typically it's kinetic harm. Mm -hmm. uh, usually it's foreign countries, foreign entities. Mm -hmm. um, and usually they'll have an address, so they're a nation state right. sort right. of thing. So that's how the Department of Defense. Now you could, and many academics and, and uh, political leaders and uh, commentary, uh, make make uh, various suggestions of other things that are threatened. Uh, I've heard people say things like climate change. I've heard people say the infrastructure of the United States, uh, the education system. Yeah, yeah. All of those are probably valid in terms of uh, an intellectual argument. Mm -hmm. But for those of us in uniform, when we talk about threats, we're talking about those that can do physical harm to the United States mm. and attempt to destroy mm -hmm. uh, the con that constitution, the mm -hmm. people of our country, our way of life sort of thing. Right. And those typically tend to be nation states. They right. can be terrorist organizations. Right. They don't have to be a nation state, but, right. but typically they are. So we think, uh, at least our view right now, is that China is the number one geopolitical threat to the mm -hmm. United States, at least for the next 50 and perhaps longer mm. number of years. And why is that? It's because China uh, has the power potential, mm -hmm. uh, the economic uh, right. uh, potential, the, right. the population potential, right. the, the military potential. Uh, to equal or surpass the United mm -hmm. States if we're not careful. So mm -hmm. China clearly has the capability uh, to be a superior military economic uh, power uh, in, in the years ahead. Yeah. They also have demonstrated they have a will to do that. Yeah. You know, they have published yeah. documents and books and pamphlets <clears throat> and speeches and so on that they fully intend, uh, China does, fully intend to surpass the United States uh, in, in gross net power uh, by uh, by mid century by 2049 is the yeah. uh, is their stated goal. They spell it all out there. They yeah. they put yeah. it all out there. Yeah. So yeah. China is clearly there. Yeah. Uh, Russia is clearly a significant uh, challenge yeah. to the United States. Yeah. Uh, they've got significant nuclear capability. They're, <clears throat> they're bogged down in a very serious and high cost yeah. war in Ukraine. Yeah. But they're very very dangerous. Uh, right. Uh, and and they do threaten U.S. national security interests, mm -hmm. particularly in Europe but elsewhere as well. Uh, Iran and North Korea are are, are there as 
as more regional threats, but threats mm -hmm. nonetheless, that uh, if some sort of uh, armed conflict were to erupt with any one of them, uh, that would be serious, it would be significant, it would be high cost. Right. Uh, right. So, uh, and then, then I would add, the last one I'd add is uh, terrorists. Uh, so there's a variety of terrorist organizations around the world yeah. that want to do harm to the United States and want to kill our people and, uh, and, 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 and hurt our interests around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are out there, there's many of them. Um, so we have to have strategies and capabilities uh, to deal with China and Russia and North Korea and Iran and right. terrorists. That is not to discount these other forms of threats. Right. Uh, it's just that's what the military is what really focused should to be. Do. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Well, boy, that uh, that was a tough question. A great job. Let me throw an easy one at you. Yeah. It says, what has been the most challenging part of returning to civilian life, and what has been the most enjoyable part? That's from William L. And, and yeah. uh, um, um, challenging uh, hasn't really been uh, tremendously challenging, to be honest with you. So. Um, we we uh, went ahead and, and, and bought a place, uh, first civilian house in, yeah. in our career, my wife yeah. and I, uh, in 44 years we've been living in yeah. family housing. So uh, so that that actually was a bit of a challenge. This might be a dis to to different out. answer if yeah, they yeah. asked our, our wives. The challenge may be we're around too much. That's right. Well, that, <laughs> that I can tell you is true uh, from my wife's perspective. Yeah. Uh, but I, I would... Uh, um, you know, the enjoyable part is I'm getting a hell of a lot more sleep. Yeah. I haven't yeah. got rid of my bags. I still have a face for <laughs> still have a face for radio and I got the bags in the eyes. I got all that. But uh but yeah, no, getting yeah. some getting some decent I, sleep. I can't I can't imagine the pace that you were at. Uh that, that's just well, unbelievable. Well as, as as uh you know, as chief and, and particularly as chairman. Yeah. You're averaging, you know, literally maybe four to five hours sleep a night yeah. on a good night. On right? a good night, yeah. Uh, very, very yeah. rarely do you ever get seven right. or eight, right? Right. Uh, and and that is the opposite now. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. On average, getting seven or eight. That's yeah. good. Yeah. So working yeah. on the bags, but yeah. Uh, but we'll see. But that that clearly has been a benefit. And, yeah. Uh, and then uh, and then obviously spending time with my family. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Had an opportunity to to spend time with my kids and, and grandkids. I don't think people uh, realize the sacrifices over the years of all you right. missed and right. family and now you well, can like be you with them. And, and so many yeah. others in uniform. Yeah. yeah. Uh, most of our adult life, or at least yeah. the last 20 years, yeah. was year on, year off to right. either Afghanistan or Iraq. So, right. um, you know, there's a yeah. lot of sacrifice. And, and yeah. the people who sacrifice more uh, than us in uniform yeah. is our family. Yeah. Especially the yeah. kids. Yeah. Uh, and the kids process... Uh, your dad or your mom going off to, uh, you know, deployments and combat situations, a lot different than an adult does. Yeah. Uh, so our kids uh, sacrifice way more in very real terms right. uh, than we do. We don't fully understand all of this. Yeah, no, I agree so with you. Having yeah, time completely. to spend with yeah. them and the grandkids That's a great point. tremendous. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Here's a, a good question uh, from uh, uh, how important has professional reading been to your development as an Army officer? Uh, what advice do you have? on what to read to inform your views as a military professional. And that's from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tim Reck from the Office of Director of the Army Staff. So a uh, great question. And I well, know I, you have I strong think, feelings I, I think on that. I have, yeah, yeah, you should read the Army Chief's uh, reading list. Reading every, list. Every yeah. book on there. <laughs> every book. Every book on there, Colonel. By, by so, next week. Yeah, yeah. so look, at, I've, uh, I think uh, not, not only just reading like books, uh, but a commitment to lifelong learning. Yeah. I think that's yeah. important. So uh, that's you're a learning. Point. Goes learning. back to the commitment you talked about earlier. That's right. One of those is to right. learn and, you and study step, the profession. You got to step yeah. with the times. You got to study yeah. the profession. You got to understand the environment you're operating in. Right. right. So it may be books, it may be articles. Uh, but look at reading, in many ways, reading is free, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you're learning uh, from the past mm -hmm. uh, or you're learning from other people's analysis. Mm -hmm. And it's not costing you anything except a little bit of time mm -hmm. to, to read it, right? And you can gain huge insights. Uh, think about uh, your personal experience in combat, right? Uh, let's say you do a 20-year career, uh, and, and let's say it was in the last 20 years. You might have done one, two, three, or four deployments or something mm -hmm. like that. You may spend a year or two in combat zones. Mm -hmm. um, but think about if you were to read the history of the American Civil War or, or World War II or World War I. Or, uh, those wars lasted for years. Yeah. So you're getting yeah. years of experience yeah, good through the written word. Right. So right. Uh, I think reading is, is critically important. Yeah. Uh, I would also... Uh, commend that there's tons of books out there that are really great. Yeah. Uh, but I would take a, uh, I would do a little bit of research and go for high quality books that stood the test of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and great point. Those. You know, things like, I know it sounds a little bit trite and probably a little bit, you know, like a commercial or something like that, but you know, Clausewitz and Sun Tzu, yeah. those kind of guys, yeah. Yeah. those have been around for a long time. Right. Try to read them. They're really hard to read by the way, yeah. but, but yeah. read them, uh, try to understand them. Uh, and then supplement that with, uh, your military history reading of, 
of like the Napoleonic Wars, American right. Civil War, World right. One, World War Two, your major armed conflicts, but then yeah. also uh, take a hard look at, at at wars that weren't so big. Yeah, you know, look at Vietnam yeah. and yeah. look at Korea and so on, Great uh, or look at you know the American Revolution or any yeah. any number of conflicts. But don't just limit yourself uh, to just military history. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, if you're going to uh, operate at a strategic level right. or even an operational level, you're going to have to consider things like economics and, right. and information and diplomacy and all the other elements of national power that will apply. Things that they teach in the war. Yeah, culture. exactly. So read widely, widely and, and, and read uh, deeply uh, and, and read as often as you possibly can. I, I can remember uh, uh, Colin Powell being asked the same question uh, when I was in the War College. I had the exact same answer. Oh, really? So that's solid advice. Look at that. Just yeah, that. exactly. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's just fantastic. So, uh, well said. Uh, let's see a question from Rich S here. That's it looks a really uh, interesting one. He, goes, he thanks you for your career of selfless service. <clears throat> he says regarding leadership and lessons learned, can you share an example, especially in the early years of your service, of where you may have encountered failure or less than your expectations? I know that never happened to you, but <laughs> let's just try to make time. it up. And how you overcame it, incorporate it into your future leadership. Great, great question from Rich. What, what do you? Well, think? look at um, you know we we all have stumbled yeah uh, hundreds of times, if not thousands of times, over the years. Uh, as a young officer, I can remember as a second lieutenant, uh, literally getting miserably lost, yeah, <laughs> leading my platoon in, <laughs> around in the woods, like say it doesn't say no way, no yeah, way. Yeah, it was really you bad. were just temporarily yeah, missing. And, and, and a platoon yeah. sergeant saves me. You know, he comes up and so sir, you're really here. And I said, yeah. oh, great. So, uh, but there's simple, you know, things like that, right? Uh, all the way up through uh, um, significant uh, issues that, you know, for example, all the way up through Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staff. Yeah. Um, or, or Chief Staff of the Army. So uh, th there's a lot of failures along the way. The key, uh, and, and, and we, the United States Army, uh, really uh, revolutionized the concept of learning yeah. in the military with the right. concept of the after action. Right, right. right. And, and I would argue that, whether it's something as simple as, uh, you know, getting lost in the woods yeah. uh, or something much more serious uh, at a much higher level, um, conducting rigorous, thorough, honest uh, self-assessments and reviews, after yeah. action reviews, yeah. like what we do at Joint Readiness Training Center or the National Training Center, right. uh, to do those on a personal basis but on a collective basis. Yeah. Uh, and point. that's how you advance your learning. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I've done that a million times. Uh, and it's the AAR. Yeah. You know, the question is, yeah. uh, how do you incorporate that? It's the, it's the AAR. You're constantly it, doing it. It's a great question because uh, I, I've seen a lot of the younger generation. I'll consider younger generation, you know, 40 and younger, let's say, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're very afraid of failure, it seems like, more sure. than we were. And I think part of that is because you used to be able to isolate failure. Now it's everywhere. It goes on in social media. You can't, you know, it's hard to isolate yeah, it and yeah. stuff. So. But well, I we think if they take that approach, yeah. if they do that approach of the AAR, they're going to be, you know, yeah, learn I, I, more and how I, you recover. As a, as I was a, a observer controller at GMTC. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and that, as you know, that's where you put the light infantry battalions mm -hmm. uh, through, through, the, through the ropes. Uh, and then as an OC, as a battalion OC, you're responsible to do the AAR for these yeah. units, right? Yeah. Same thing happens at the National Training Center for the Mechanism. Right. Units. So um, I learned... Um, how important that AER was mm. collectively, but also as an individual. Mm -hmm. So as an OC, I would get with the battalion commander, mm. uh, and and it'd be quiet, it'd be one on one, but let them know here's the goods, here's the bads, right? <clears throat> and here's some suggestions to consider on how to improve uh, that methodology, that technique. Uh, you, you'll find that in business, you'll yeah. find that in yeah. in the corporate world, uh, civilian forms of right. government. You'll find that in right. sports. Right. The sports teams are great at it. Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, that's what films are. Right. After, after a game. Right. Uh, yeah. You're constantly sitting there with the coach, yeah. and, and you're beating the crap out of yourself about mm -hmm. the films. And, and look at I dropped the ball here. I, I missed the mm -hmm. block there. So the and AAR, they learn much more when they lose than and, when they win. When they win, they're on to the next game. When they lose, it yeah. hurts so much. That's right. You're digging into what happened. So they, you're yeah, trying to figure AAR, it out. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's yeah, a great As point. the greatest basketball player from, from West Point that ever lived, I'm sure that you have plenty of experience <laughs> yeah, hardly, under Coach K. Hardly. So, but I did experience a lot of failure <laughs> in a lot of AARs, yeah, yeah, no doubt. He was great at AAR. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. A brilliant with it. No, it's, those are great points. Let me give you another. Here's another answering from uh, Esther. Uh, what was your best day in the Army? And what was it about that day that you would want others to know about? That may be a tough one. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I could isolate a single, single best day. day. Yeah, that's I mean, tough. There were, there, there's a lot of good days. There's a lot of bad days, too. Yeah. Uh, look at yeah. the, the Army, not just the Army. Uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, yeah. any, any form of military service is a life of sacrifice. 
And it's not just a job. It's a, like I said, about up front, about commitment. It's more of a vocation. It's almost a, it's almost like a religious calling if yeah. you want to make this thing yeah. a career. And, and you think about uh, a, a, a job uh, that's re that's asking you to potentially give your life. Yeah. Think about that. That's, that, that, that's that's yeah. not just a job. You, yeah, that, that's something that's other a, than you, just commitment. A job. You were talking that's about that's not a nine earlier. to five pick up yeah. a check. Yeah, sort of exactly. Thing. So it's a level of commitment mm -hmm. where you may have to actually sacrifice your, mm -hmm. or as a commander, mm -hmm. right? And you've been a commander many times. As a commander, you're going to make decisions mm -hmm. that are literally uh, going to put people in harm's way. Right. And every single soldier, and I've had soldiers killed under my command many times, and you have as well. Mm -hmm. Every single soldier that was killed under my command, I personally put them there at the time and place of their yeah, death. Think yeah, about that. Yeah, that's so the burden is huge. Right. And and the and the uh, you know so isolating a single day is a great day mm -hmm. versus all those days that are horrible. Yeah. There's a lot of tough stuff in the military. Right. Right. But the the cumulative feeling or sense of selfless service to a to a cause that's yeah. much bigger than yourself. Right. Uh, I, I wouldn't single single out a day. Yeah. But I would say that military service is very worth it because That's a you're tremendous serving point. Yeah. You're you're serving, you know, three hundred and twenty five million Americans. Right. You're serving a cause or children at you know, one and two years old. Right. <clears throat> to allow them to enjoy the fruits of life, liberty, and the pursuit right. of happiness in the future. Uh, that's something that knows no price in, in right. my in my mind. So the goodness yeah. is the sense of selfless service, and then there's there's plenty and no one should have any uh illusions about it is there's a lot of dark days yeah. serving in the military and those yeah. are hard uh it requires a high degree of uh, uh of resilience and mm -hmm. a high degree of commitment uh, mm -hmm. to get through those dark days but there's goods and bads it'd be the greatest team you're ever on but it's a tremendous point you know that uh, uh that it's that selfless service right. and we don't talk about it enough in our country and it knows uh you know that uh, that's true happiness mm -hmm. uh not being a uh, you know, millionaire or right. uh, influencer or whatever it may right. be. Yeah, great, well said, great, great answer. Here, here's a good one, a little tougher one. We're going back to the tough ones now. Mm. Given that the global environment is much different now than it was in 1980 when, when uh, you came in, uh, how can we engender you know, the uh, a true intellectual flexibility in our leaders to address both operational and modernization issues? That's from Colonel Retired Mike Smith. A great question, Mike. So operational intellectual flexibility you know yeah i mean um, th that comes early on with your yeah. initial education um and and being having the ability to be open-minded to new ideas mm -hmm. um, and i think also to stay fresh uh you need to interact uh with not just yourself in a book but you need to interact <clears throat> with other people in your command your mm -hmm. subordinates your sergeants uh your captains your lieutenants etc and be open to all kinds of ideas. Uh, do not shut ideas down because they seem outlandish. Listen to them, take them in. Yeah, good and at point. the end of the day, Very if you're good the point. commander, you're gonna yeah. have to uh, make the decision. But the intellectual flexibility, I think that comes frankly through education. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. that's the framework, the foundation of it. Yeah, and the point. Army in particular, uh, and I, as you mentioned up front, I went to the Naval War College. Um, and, you know, the, 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 Ar the, the Navy, the, the Marines, and the Air Force do a great job, and I love them all, right, mm -hmm. as a joint officer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the Army sets the standard for education, mm -hmm. uh, and that's well known no throughout all the services. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we, we uh, educate our officers at, at, at certain gates throughout their career uh, and on commission officers uh, <clears throat> uh, to ensure that they are fresh and to ensure that they right. are exposed to new ideas. Right, uh, right here in this building right now, uh, you've got an ASAP class going mm -hmm. on with a young general officer, mm -hmm. uh, and you're exposing them to new ideas, et cetera. So you never want to stay static. You want to stay... Uh, not only flexible, but you want to stay open to new ideas, and that's how you maintain your intellectual flexibility. That's a great point. That's the uh, ASEP is the Army Strategic Education Program <clears throat> that's uh, going on today. It's a great, great point, Mark. Thanks. Uh, and, and it makes me think of you demonstrated that as Chief of Staff, uh, tr the largest transformation in 40 plus years. You had to really look at what were the key priorities. You had to eliminate a whole bunch of other things in the famous mm -hmm. Night Court. Mm -hmm. You had to form some new organization. Yeah. What can you can you talk through as you were? Uh, I don't want you, you know, you don't need to go through the entire mm -hmm. thing. But, you know, what what led you to that, and and uh, how were you able to do that, knowing, you know, it's it's pretty risky if you get it wrong. Well, yeah, the um, you know Michael Howard, <coughs> the famous <coughs> British historian, he said uh, it, for the military and, and the the idea of uh, future plans and modernization. Yeah. 
He said, you, you're not going to get it right. Yeah. And you have to go in understanding that you're not going to get it right. What you have to do is get it less wrong than your enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, so combat and war is all a relative thing. It's right. all relative to right. your opponent. So you got to get it less wrong. Yeah. You're never going to get it right. And and you, as I become chief of staff of, uh, of the Army, you are my transition team leader, right? Mm -hmm. And we went to school for mm -hmm. you know, a good uh, 60 days, right. 90 days on previous transitions right. from previous chiefs. Right. Uh, and we looked at the operating environment, and we realized that at that point, and this is 2015, right. Um, that we were at the tail end of, uh, you know, at that point, 15 years of, of, uh, uh, of unconventional warfare, right. uh, counterinsurgency warfare, mm -hmm. and that there were uh, other threats emerging on the horizon in the exactly. operating environment, Russia, yeah. China, et cetera. Right. Uh, so we needed to have a balanced force that is capable of dealing with both simultaneously in a mm -hmm. variety. And, and to do that, uh, what we decided to do was uh, to take the time of my time of, uh, of chief uh, for the first uh, two years to focus on readiness of the current force uh, with the second priority mm -hmm. being the modernization of the current force. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second two years to shift gears and then refocus on modernization. Right. Uh, so those are always uh, the priorities. But the readiness readiness matters. Right. Readiness is so yeah. critical to deterrence. Yeah. Readiness is key. You can't to, say, oh, I can't go. No, don't send me now. Right. You know, right. They're right. not asking. you got to be ready. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. we focused on that. I said, in fact, my, yeah. my opening comments were, you know, readiness is the number one priority and they'll never be right. another number one. Right. Um, but modernization is nothing more than a, than a euphemism, a, a different word for future readiness. Yeah. So you've got to pay attention to the modernization piece. And to that extent, that's where Army Futures Command comes in, yeah. for example, yeah. uh, where we decided uh, the Army leadership, and, and, and we come up with this idea, worked closely with then right. Senator McCain, uh, and, then, and, then, and then Jim McConville and Secretary McCarthy and Secretary Esper, et cetera. Come up, we come up with this idea <clears throat> of Army Futures Command in order to propel the Army into a modernization program that will be appropriate for right. the future operating environment. And the first too thing you have to do- Too stovepiped in the other system and too, too fractured. It's really made a huge difference, I can tell it's you. It's made a huge difference. Futures command. And the first and thing you got to do is, faster, yeah. is determine, um, first thing you had to do was determine the future operating environment. Right. And that's where you came in. That's where Dave Perkins right. came in. That's where right. Dan Allen came in. Mm -hmm. in. In terms of defining what that operating environment mm -hmm. was, was all about. And then once you define that, what would be the attributes of a force that could be optimized to succeed in that right. future operating right. environment. Right. And that's where we come up with the priorities. Right. So we, we know from you know study of military history, your ability to see, uh, your ability to shoot, mm -hmm. your ability to move, your ability to communicate command and control, and your ability to sustain right. are fundamentals. They're not going to go away. Right. But how you do that depends on the environment mm -hmm. uh, and the operating environment and where you're going to do it in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's where we come up with the priorities of, of, uh, of that the Army is actually using right. these modernization programs and they've, today. They've remained. And they've remained. Uh, even Very constant. Uh, another tremendous uh, you know, uh, idea you have is the cross-functional teams yep. within that. Yep. So, you know, they're working together and staying longer and focused on those priorities. That's that's just... Well, the uh, Army has had, um, and, and I read something maybe a week or two ago, that the Army's had the most success in their modernization programs yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the last uh, four to six, eight years. Right. Uh, than they had in the last 40 years. Right. Uh, since 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 uh, uh, General Vono and General Sullivan introduced, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the big five, right? Right. From, from the, right. From the airline yeah. battle days, right? Yeah. So uh, this is the most success the Army's had. And in fact, as a chairman, I can look at all the service and mm -hmm. they would tell you that the Army's modernization program has set the standard, set the yeah. standard for the other services. And yeah. Many of them are imitating many mm -hmm. of the things that the mm -hmm. Army's doing. The Army has a very good foundation now right. for modernization. And, and there's a few things uh, that that they clearly will have to pick the pace up on. Sure, uh, but but they are definitely focused on the modernization of the army. And uh, you know, as we look at that future strategic environment, I know you were uh, you believed a big believer in all domain operations and uh, mm -hmm. the army's multi-domain operations. And yeah, can you just a little bit on that as you know the role of uh, the services and uh, your thoughts uh, going forward? And you think uh, it's tough because you got to be more joint than you are now. But uh, it seems critical. So uh, you did a lot for that. What are your well? The whole idea behind the multi-domain task force that was an organization. Yeah. It is an organization. Yeah. I think there's uh, I think there's uh, three of these things now, and they're expanding to five here mm -hmm. shortly. So again, it goes back to the future operating environment. Mm -hmm. We know the future operating environment 
is going to be highly lethal, mm -hmm. uh, that the ability to see is better than any time in human history. Right. The ability to shoot at range and with accuracy and speed, right. hypersonics, and right. precision munitions, better than any time in history. Right. We know the advent of artificial intelligence is going to uh, really significantly, like quantum 10x level, yeah. improve uh, decision making. Yeah. Uh, so no that's going to be a highly lethal environment. Mm -hmm. We know also that the introduction of robotics is going to mm -hmm. come at us here very, very quickly in the next 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to change the environment. So what are the attributes then that you need to be to be successful, you need to have to be successful in that environment? And one of those attributes is, first attribute is survive. Mm -hmm. So how do you survive in a highly lethal environment where people can see you and shoot you uh, at great right. range, except for right. precision? Right. Uh, you you survive in that environment uh, by being small, mm -hmm. by being mobile, mm -hmm. uh, and by being hidden. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you look around at, at our programs, the joint programs uh, for the, all the military. Um, and I, I would argue that many of our programs probably are not small. Mm -hmm. The actual end state product, mm -hmm. the weapon, point. not yeah. necessarily small. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily constantly in motion. Right. Many of them are fixed sites. Right. Uh, and and they're not necessarily easily concealable. Mm -hmm. But those mm -hmm. are attributes that you're going to have to have in a future armed yeah, conflict, exactly. or you're going to get killed, right? Right. So right. that that's an example mm -hmm. of how the system needs to modify. And here's another one: is um, we know that uh, right now uh, it's estimated anyway that there'll be uh, about maybe nine or ten billion people uh, in the world mm. by mid-century. Mm. Uh, if that proposition is true, and if Clausewitz is right that that that, that war is about politics and politics is about people. Uh, then decision in war is going to happen uh, where people live on, right. on the land, right. uh, and and you will arguably uh, have uh, you know decisions going to happen where people mm -hmm. live, right? Mm -hmm. So where are people going to live by mid-century? Mm -hmm. Of that eight to ten billion people, uh, probably ninety percent are going to live in highly dense urban. Mm -hmm. Our military and our Great army point. specifically. Yeah has been optimized for warfare in mm -hmm. rural areas, yeah. uh, deserts, etc. Open, open and they're sub-optimized yeah. yeah. for warfare in urban areas, mountains, and jungles. Right. Right. We know that highly dense urban areas are going to be the center, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the center of conflict in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps not yet, but in the future. But witness, for example, Raqqa, yeah. Mosul, yeah. Uh, Kiev, yeah. uh, Gaza, yeah. these are all highly Right. Dense urban areas. Right. So our military has to optimize for urban combat yeah. in the future. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that no military is optimized for that yet. Right. Uh, right. So, so those are type things. The attributes uh, of, of an urban-oriented uh, military is different than an, the right. attributes for no, a those rural are military. Great points. And thankfully, we've got the, the programs moving in that direction, they the are. transformation, that, yeah. to be able to handle that. Uh, we'd, we'd be in trouble. Uh, great question from Mark H. here. Really, it's uh, thinking back to when you were a new platoon leader. That's a long time ago. Okay, but uh, just commenting on non-commissioned officers, how they helped you develop your leadership skills, how they helped you in the early days, and then what you saw. You know, the, we have the finest NCO corps in the world, mm -hmm. and how they make a difference on the battlefield. Just uh, you know, I think we're other armies clearly jealous of non-commissioned officers. So just your experiences and thoughts with that, that David B. I wanted to know. Yeah, I mean, the uh, look, look at the um, of the 2.1 million people in uniform today across all the services. Uh, only about uh, eight to ten percent are officers. Mm. Ninety percent. Yeah. Of everybody in uniform is enlisted. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and it is. and the enlisted force like that, yeah. is directly, not yeah. indirectly, but directly led uh, by non-commissioned officers. Yeah. Yeah. It is it. It sounds like a bumper sticker, but it's not to say yeah. that the non-commissioned officer uh, is the backbone of the military. Right. They are. Right. They are in fact. Right. It's not. It's not just a, a saying. Yeah. So they are in fact the the leaders of all of the units in the United States military, from small to mm -hmm. to, to large, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's and it's critical that we have a great NCO corps, and we do. Uh, my my experience uh, as a young officer was uh, my NCOs really were quite patient with me. Yeah. And and I learned a lot uh, from them and they took the time out uh you know to teach me. And right. I, and it was a learning right. experience. And sometimes and, painful. And I'm sure like like me, not afraid to tell you when you no, had they some were stupid never, ideas. No. <laughs> but they did it in a way that was yeah. respectful. They never, exactly. They exactly. never disrespected you or any of that kind of right. stuff. But right. uh and, but they were always professional about it. So my first platoon sergeant, my 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 squad leaders were, were excellent and they, they wrapped their arms around me and they knew that mm. They had to kind of teach me and, and help me out. So that held true uh, as a company commander. I had two companies, 
Uh, both first sergeants were great. All the platoon sergeants and and the squad leaders in in, in, the, in those companies were outstanding and and in the same drill. Then as a battalion commander, the same held true there uh, with Sergeant Major. So one of the great things about the Army is that every level of officer leadership, there's a non commissioned officer counterpart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I had Sergeant Major Daly, who's here now right. in the USA. Right. Um, and he was just a tremendous uh, Sergeant Major of the right. Army. Uh, I was very lucky to have C.Z. Colon Lopez as the mm. as the senior enlisted Air Force. Uh, Power rescue guys, the right. enlisted guy for for me as the mm -hmm. as the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs. So look at at every level, you as an officer are going to have a non commissioned officer. Yeah. And and I would counsel and advise, no matter what level it is, listen closely. Yeah. They have a completely different perspective than you mm -hmm. might have. They come from a different background. Uh, they bring it together a different skill set than you might have. Right. Listen to them and make sure it's a team. Great it's advice. Not, it's not one or the other. Yeah. It's both of you. Yeah. Great advice and. And, and again, uh, you're absolutely, you know, the backbone makes yeah. a difference, no totally. doubt about it. Uh, here's a, a, a question on uh, challenges when you are a battalion and brigade commander. And a battalion commander, you were in Korea, brigade commander in combat uh, in, uh, in Baghdad. And, uh, but, you know, so I'm sure you had a, a wide uh, range of challenges in sure. all those assignments. It may be hard to narrow them down. But, as you as you look at, uh, and that's from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Michelle Cutts Dolberry, uh, uh, any that jump out that uh, might be good leadership lessons of some of the well, challenges. For, you had. for a battalion command, my battalion command, I, I suppose every battalion command is unique, right? But yeah, uh, mine was particularly unique because I commanded First Battalion, Five or Sixth Infantry, mm -hmm. it was an air assault battalion, Second Division uh, at Camp Greaves in Korea, right up on the DMZ. Yeah, it was right up yeah. on the DMZ. Yeah. We, were, we were, I think it was like fifteen hundred meters or something yeah. from the yeah. North Korean front line mm -hmm. trace, right? So. Um, and, and our focus, our obsession was readiness, literally every day. Uh, there were, there were no families accompanied. It was an unaccompanied tour for everybody. Mm. My family lived down in, uh, Seoul. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and we, and I was up there, uh, I, I would see my family maybe, uh, I guess really two days a month or something like that. Mm -hmm. I would go back to mm -hmm. Seoul. That was a challenge. So the family piece was definitely a challenge, but from the military professional piece, I couldn't have asked for a better outfit. Um, the the discipline in that unit was incredible. Mm. Um, the company commanders and first sergeants were off the charts great. I had tremendous uh, XOs and, and S3s. Mm. Uh, and many of these guys have moved on now and commanded battalions, brigades, and, and divisions themselves. Yeah. Um, so I, I was very, very fortunate. In fact, the commander in Korea right now is my S3. Mm. Paul so well, that gives you an idea of yeah. some of the talent yeah. that's in that battalion. In the, yeah. um, so from a military professional standpoint, that was an incredible battalion. Yeah. The standards were high, uh, very, very few discipline mm. problems, hardly any Article 15 sort of thing. Um, and it was an extraordinary battalion uh, who was constantly ready. But, you, you know, you had you were facing the North Koreans, like literally mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, not very far from you. So there was clearly you were motivated to be ready all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and the challenge, I think, in, in that assignment was uh, on families, whether you were separated from your family uh, by yeah. the Pacific Ocean sure, uh, or you were separated, you know, between Seoul yeah. and, and, and the yeah. DMZ. Sure. Uh, the, the family piece was very, very difficult, right. I think, on that yeah, particular Yeah, that makes side. sense. Yeah, um, quite a balance. Yeah, there. brigade was yeah. different. Yeah. So yeah. brigade, I commanded brigade in uh, 10th Mountain Division. Right, right. Uh, and, and the one thing I that jumped out at me right away was the difference in size, scale, and scope of a brigade versus a battalion. Yeah. So yeah. A, a battalion, you're right on the cusp of direct leadership. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. It's indirect because you have a staff. It's the first level we have mm -hmm. a staff. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're really there with troops. And, right. and in my particular case, you're with troops all day long. I've heard someone say they recognize your walk at night. Yeah. At time yeah, yeah. After that, probably not. Now, <laughs> at brigade level, most of the troops might not even know who you are. Yeah, it's exactly. That, yeah, yeah. Brigades are big organizations. Yeah. These are, these are yeah. 5,000 person right. organizations. Right. Uh, and you're task organized for combat, so you're getting organizations from other units. Mm -hmm. So brigade is very much an indirect form of leadership. Uh, and in my case, we deployed uh, both to Afghanistan uh, and to Iraq. Mm. Um, in Afghanistan, we broke up. I had one battalion in, in Iraq. Yeah. Uh, I had a company in uh, in East Africa. That's a huge and challenge. And the rest of the brigade was in yeah. Afghanistan. So we yeah. split apart. Wow. Uh, and in, and in, uh, when we went to Iraq, we had our brigade together, but we also brought in several battalions from other brigades. And we were task organized in Baghdad. I think, uh, if memory serves me right, we were, we were about nine or 10,000 troops in my brigade in Baghdad, mm. uh, which was huge. Yeah. It was, uh, we yeah. were subordinated to the, yeah. uh, we, were, we were task organized on the 1st right. Cavalry Division and later 3rd Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't working, uh, I wasn't working for my division. Uh, I was not working for 10th Mountain, I was working mm -hmm. for 1st Cav and then 3ID. 
Uh, so your dynamics are totally different mm -hmm. uh, at the brigade level uh, and, and than they are at the battalion level. That's uh, a great, uh, appreciate it, and I'm sure extremely helpful. Uh, a question on how the war in Ukraine has shaped your thinking on the potential for a U.S. conflict with a peer adversary uh, to become protracted, you know, the defense taking priority uh, as opposed to a short, decisive conflict. That's from Charles M. So uh, uh, pretty, pretty interesting. You know, how has Ukraine shaped your thoughts on that? I think there's uh, you know, a lot of le lessons learned from any war, right? And, yeah. And there's things that are that can be applied in the immediate and some things uh, a little bit further on. Uh, I think one of the things that you take away from the Ukraine war is um, what I would call a people in arms. So when the Russians invaded Ukraine, mm -hmm. illegally, by the way, in a war of aggression, uh, and Ukraine was never going to attack uh, Russia, uh, Russia attacked a country that had been free uh, since 1991, I think it was, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so if you look at the demographic mm -hmm. of Ukraine, the vast majority of people in Ukraine especially those of military age, mm -hmm. who have grown up in a free and independent country. Mm -hmm. uh, free peoples are not easily conquered. So when, when Russia went into Ukraine, they triggered a nation in arms. Mm -hmm. So they weren't just fighting the Ukrainian army. They were fighting the Ukrainian people. Mm -hmm. uh, and every village and every street and every, in, in, in every town and city of Ukraine that Russian troops appeared, yeah. they, were, they were viewed as an enemy, an occupying force. Right. And the entire people became a source of intelligence right. for, the, right. for the Ukrainian military. So... The idea of a people in arms, the idea of a of a nation defending itself, uh, and they weren't attacking Russia; they were right. defending itself. Right. That's a big, huge takeaway, and it can be applied elsewhere. Uh, think about, for example, Taiwan. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying I'm not going to predict the future on Taiwan. Right. Uh, I think that that uh, that is clearly unknown. Uh, but take any country that is right. invaded by uh, uh, by a foreign invader, uh, you can easily trigger. A nation in arms, where you're fighting the sure. people, yeah. not just their army. Yeah. So that's a big lesson. Yeah. Another one I think is uh, is uh, mission command. Mm. So one of the reasons, not mm. the only reason, but one of the reasons that I think the Ukrainians did so well in the defense um, is they applied the methodologies of mission command, mm -hmm. uh, commander's intent. Mm -hmm. Now remember, we have been working with the Ukrainians since 2014. Right. So we've been training them on mission command uh, for many years, uh, right. ten years now. And that had an effect uh, because the way they commanded and controlled their battlefield uh, when the Russians invaded yeah. was in a decentralized way yeah. where local commanders were given great autonomy yeah. to make whatever tactical decisions were necessary to uh, defeat the a, enemy on the battlefield. Tremendous point. You couldn't get a greater contrast between that and the way the Russians right. micromanaged, didn't even tell That's the right. people they were invading. That's right. It's the an Russians amazing were, contrast. Were yeah. Top down, great centrally point. controlled. Yeah. Yeah. And the third and final big lesson, I think, that you're seeing is the advent of different types of technology, yeah. uh, specifically drones. Right. Drones are having a very significant effect yeah. on the battlefield. Yeah. Uh, in in uh, in in Ukraine, uh, you'll see the, the Russians are using them, the Ukrainians right. are using them. Right. Uh, it's really a big impact. So yeah. I think that's something that w is worthy of uh, some tremendous oh, study. Great, great points. Well, the last question I've, I've seen numerous people have asked this one, and uh, I'll save it for the last question. Is everybody wants to know? Are you going to write a book? <laughs> uh, with about all your experiences and, uh, and, and lots of lots of people really really want. I think it'd be it'd be I'm incredible I'm to capture it all. It's too early right now. I'm not, yeah, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, I'm still, uh, you know, working. We want you to have it done by next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, it, you know, look at I've, I've uh, I'm, I'm looking at writing some yeah. different things. Yeah, and and, and uh, you know, a lot of people talk about a memoir. And right, all. right. That's not the kind of thing that I think is yeah necessarily helpful. But I do think that. I may write on, um, like I was talking about, the future operating environment, right, right. Uh, technology, and how right. our military needs to modernize in, in what areas, that oh, sort yeah. of thing. I got Might you. do some of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I did a lot as uh, as uh, throughout my career, whether it was um, you know in the younger years mm -hmm. as, a, as a battalion commander or mm -hmm. uh, as chairman on crisis management. Right. So uh, I think I, there's some lessons that I think I could. Yeah. Uh, put down on paper that could contribute to people's understanding. Very useful. Yeah. President Bush wrote a book, uh, you know, uh, I think it was called Seven Decisions. Right. Uh, or, or Decision Points, I think it was called. And then uh, and then uh, Graham Allison, uh, professor at Harvard, he wrote a book called The Essence of Decision. Mm. There's been a lot of books out there about uh, decision making at the right. national security level. Right. right. Uh, and I think I could maybe make a contribution in that regard. Uh, right. I'm not sure yet. But some of those things are, are, are kind oh, of... I, I'm amazing. certain you could. And a lot of folks uh, asked it and uh, wanted to know up there. So I think uh, 
Uh, no, that that'd be a great one in an area certainly that needs um, based on your experience what you went through. That'd be yeah, great. I've had so, I've had a lot of um, yeah, a lot. lot we'll of expect time. it. We'll give you we'll yeah. give you a few months. Yeah, yeah maybe, and, maybe we'll bring it to AUSA. Yeah, yeah. no problem. Yeah. We'll <laughs> unveil it at AUSA. But uh, well, Mark, I tell you, we can't thank you enough. How can we ever thank you? Forty-four years <clears> of dedicated service that you did for our nation. Absolutely incredible, and uh, just uh, grateful and and proud to have served with you and. Uh, I know uh, we wish you uh, the greatest in retirement, uh, rest, family time, all the things you deserve that you sacrificed so much over those 44 years. So thanks for joining us. And it's just uh, thanks, really Mark. appreciate you taking yeah. all the questions. And that makes a huge difference. So thanks, well, Mark. Thanks. Appreciate, I appreciate it. it. Thank you. And AUSA does great work and you know, appreciate what you're doing for the Army and for all our troops. No, it's, uh, it's our honor. Thanks sure. so much. Well, uh, really appreciate you joining us. Before we depart, I want to inform our viewers of a few upcoming events uh, at AUSA. We'll host a coffee series on 21 February featuring uh, Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael Weimer. That'll be a great one. On 6 March, we'll have a, another noon report featuring Command Sergeant Major Andrew Lombardo. He's the Command Sergeant Major of the Army Reserve, uh, and I, I would tune in to hear what he has to say in that one. That'll be great. We have another AUSA-hosted coffee series on 13 March featuring General Charles Hamilton, Commanding General of the United States Army, Materiel Command and Logistics Sustainment. Uh, it'll be a great experience on that when you want to tune in. Finally, uh, Global Force is going to be great this year. The Symposium, 26 to 28 March down in Huntsville, Alabama. We'll see you there. It'll be a great event. Hope you can join us for an upcoming webinar or event. If you need more information on any of the, these events or to register, please visit our website at ausa.org. And finally, uh, we want to thank you all who support us with your membership. We're a million and a half members strong right now, so join the Army team uh, supporting our great Army. And thank you again for attending, and have a great Army day.